Are you ready? Let's go. Ready. Ready. Yeah, ready when you are. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Holden Shepherd, Heidi Anderson, Jan Latta, Alison Patterson, welcome to my little show. Why do you call it a little chat show? Jan Nichols, Sam Iken, Annabelle Smith, Donna Mazza, Rebecca Watson, John L. Fraser, Tracy Jacobson, Adam Wallace, Monique Mulligan, Matt Glover, Karen Young. I don't even know where I'm going with this. Welcome to my show. There are so many myths around writing and around being a writer that frankly it gets up my goat. So I wanted to speak to someone about what the reality is of actually being a writer and you know in this this day and age. You know, about the publishing industry, about getting mentors, about the ups and downs, about you know, so it's not all about we see all these big time authors getting big book deals and becoming rich and famous. What is it really like? Because I wanted to get that real story. And the person I wanted to talk to is the, one of the most genuine, authentic, and vulnerable people that I know, one of the writers. His name is Laurie Steed, and he's absolutely incredible. He released You Belong Here a couple of years ago, and it was shortlisted for the WA Premier's Prize. And um, he's won a whole lot of um, residencies, writing awards, all that sort of stuff. I could lame them off, but we'll be here forever. But there's one thing about Laurie that I love. He, he is genuine and he will tell it to you straight. No pretense about him. And in this interview, we really go to places that a lot of writers normally wouldn't, wouldn't talk about. So if you are a writer or you're an emerging writer or you're an experienced writer and you just want to have a genuine conversation about what's going on and what it really is like in the trenches, then sit back. Pour yourself a cup of coffee, glass of red wine or a scotch or whatever, and let's get to know the writing industry, writing, and most importantly, Laurie Steed. Laurie Steed, thank you so much for joining me. I've been looking forward to this chat for ages. How are you going? I'm um, great, thank you. Uh, the boys are not in the house, uh, my two little ones, so it's a strangely quiet house, uh, and it feels almost like I'm in an alternate reality, uh, the writer's lab with no confusion, no distractions, um, and one key person to talk to today. So that sounds like pretty much the best day I could find ever. Excellent, and I'm glad you've chosen to speak to me. Now, Laurie, I want to sort of really, I mean, for me, you're the kind of the writer's writer. You know, you're at the coalface. You're either writing yourself or you're mentoring, encouraging other people to write. But I want to know, let's go back to the beginning. What got you the bug to write? Where did that start and what was your childhood like? Well, that's a really great question, I guess. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, it all started... When I was about five and I would spend a lot of time uh, on a trampoline on my own. Uh, I have older brothers who did their own thing and played mostly together and a sister who was very much into strawberry shortcake and sort of feminine stuff. Yes, yes. Um, and so occasionally, you know, I might wander and see what she was up to. But for the most part, I was sort of left to my own devices on this trampoline and I bounced for a while. And I'd enjoy the bounce. And then at one point or another, as the day stretched out, I would inevitably just lie there and start to think about worlds and come up with characters and people and worlds. And most of them were in space for some reason. I'm not sure yeah. what that was about, but there was generally whole colonies up in space. And I'd inevitably have my offsider, who was my partner, and do all that kind of thing. And we would fight against the monsters or the aliens or whatever it was. And so from a very early age, that was kind of my meditative process or my dissociative process, I guess. Mm. Um, I certainly had a pretty a good child in terms of it was a very loving household. I think the necessity of four children means that the last child has a little more time on his own than the other three, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was a very much a process of thinking out loud about the way worlds existed and interconnectivity of people. Um, and I often 
would just ruminate on that. I, I read a lot, obviously, once I got a little older. So I love the Roald Dahl books. The Witches was probably my favourite book of all time for a long time. And the Twits I quite enjoyed too. Uh, and so I guess in Roald Dahl that opened up this idea that it didn't fully germinate for years. Mm. But at the time, I remember reading about him having this shed up the back of his house where he'd go and he'd write his books. And I loved his humour and I also loved what I felt was quite a subversive thing about I was surrounded by pretenses all the time in my hometown of Hamilton in New Zealand, people being grown up or presenting mm. certain personas. And I love the way that Roald Dahl sort of took those apart and said and showed the wickedness beneath them. So from there, I, uh, I took a few detours. I think mm. I studied a lot. Um, and my first degree was in film and also English. And then I took some time off and I traveled the world for a bit. And then I came back and I did a journalism degree in 2002. And just prior to starting the journalism degree, uh, myself and a good friend of mine, Chris, we'd go up north and we would try to find ourselves. And it seemed fascinating just how hard it was for either of us to really find ourselves. We typically how, find. How old were you when you were trying to do that? We're a, sort of 20 ish, so mid 20s. Yeah. So mm. what had happened was. Um, I'd had, I'm pretty sure I'd had a breakup of a relationship and myself and this friend, we decided we would move in and share house a bit for a while. And then there was this idea that came out of this, that we both kind of weren't feeling that great about ourselves in our quarter life sort of mm. phase. And we came up with this phrase, new beginnings. And new beginnings was we were going to do things differently to however we'd done it to this point. And so it started off with quite silly stuff. And so we, we jumped off the Como Jetty into the Swan River fully clothed. And we would, yeah. I know, some baffling stuff along the way. And um, we would just do things that we wouldn't normally do. Mm. And then on one of these road trips up in Calberry, uh, we were gazing out at the water at night. And I turned to him and I said, I know what I, I want to do. I know what I want to do from here. Like, this is it. And he's like, oh, my God, what is it? And I said, I want to be a writer. And he was really happy for me and he was stoked. And I was stoked because I don't think I'd ever felt like mm. I'd had that level of direction in my life. Uh, and I, of course, had no idea what that actually meant, one to be a writer from this point forward. And so it was this strange kind of promise to myself that I'd heard myself for the first time in a long time mm. and was going to honour that. Uh, so I came back. Can I, can I, I'm uh, just going to stop you there for a sec, Laurie, because you've just sure. had this great epiphany. <laughs> it's like the amount of people that have an epiphany like that, like hardly any. I mean, I'm yes. still waiting for my great epiphany, but to have, <laughs> but to have that, that, that sense of, of did you, how, how deep was that knowing? Oh, it was, it, it still is that, that strong in spite of all the challenges I face. So at the time, of our road trips mm. we'd been we'd done like two or three i think from memory and we'd had a few laughs along the way we'd had some tears along the way we'd shared our favorite music we talked a lot and i think on some level um we'd worked into a space of trust which was a mm. space that i really wasn't familiar to me in terms of masculinity yeah uh, so when it came and when we're at this point of peak contentment, you know, gazing out at the water and seeing the birds, you know, gliding along and everything else, it was like I'd finally gotten still enough to just ask a big question of who I was. And it was so clear that there were all these puzzle pieces about storytelling that had come up in different ways before. So my film degree, I was obsessed really with story more than film. Mm. And I mean, anything I'd ever studied or been obsessed by was mostly about narrative. And it was mostly done in a way of telling a story differently than what had previously been the case. Now, over time, that proved its own challenge. But at the time of the epiphany, it felt as true as that rain will come or the clouds will pass over. And I've never questioned it really because it was so clearly who I am and what I was 
geared up to be in terms of my life experience before that point and my wanting to understand the world better. So the, the other big part of this is that my default setting is this world is crazy. Like I don't understand any of this. Like why is that person, why is that person doing that? That person is crazy. I mean, a common word I had pre-writing language and even post is crackhead. And I don't mean that in the drug sense. I just mean I would gaze out at the world at these crackheads and go, what are you doing? Yeah. So writing for me was always going to end up a very necessary tool for my survival. So the other poignancy about the epiphany is that I saw that it was a way to save what I felt was a life going the wrong way um, in that I would then listen instead of shutting myself up and mm. going into a space of avoidance or denial, I would finally kind of, instead of creating worlds, although I did create worlds, I'd also go inside of it and say, how do you feel day to day? Like, who are you? What do you actually want to do in this world? Uh, so I've been very lucky in that respect, uh, in that mm. it's amazing. Someone could throw like trifle after trifle at you <laughs> or any manner of cake or baked good <laughs> if you oh, know this is what <laughs> yeah, this is it. I, i'm fine with that <laughs> but if you know this is who you are and what you're going to do then ultimately in spite of doubts and in spite of fears and everything else one is going to write and create and is so it, is it is it laurie is it about finding your voice i know that sounds like a cliche but but is it the mm. way you understood the world writing was a way you could understand yourself and the world around you i mean not just the world but also and i know this is a problematic term but for me it's always been this idea of truth and mm. particularly emotional truth so for whatever reason um again getting back to that non-understanding things sometimes in a, in a relationship breakdown or something like that i might not understand how it got to be that way Mm. And so I might want to explore that in fiction. Um, and I've often thought in terms of the way we process memories and trauma and things like that, we often just need the right metaphor to process mm. it. Yeah. And so I find fiction is really powerful in that respect, that it speaks in the language of imagery versus words and even in spite of using words. So what happens when one reads as well as when one writes is it sort of offers up a metaphor for something quite powerful and that can be more emotionally truthful than if one were to just state it out loud so that's what so, i so found really with, powerful so with, are you saying that that, that will, could be the difference for you for writing fiction as opposed to writing like a, a memoir or something like that because is it is it because it's, a, it's slightly a, a more of a distance fiction is more distance to what what you are if that makes sense that is a great question because I think the reason why fiction came to me was that I didn't want to argue literal truths. I wanted to discuss emotional truths. So I may go to memoir at some point and look mm. into that and writing some right now. But the reason why fiction originally called to me is that I think it has this ability to cut the chase and an emotional truth can't really be argued because it's the writer's emotional truth. So there's real power in that. In mm. saying, well, you could, if it were memoir, you could argue the specifics. You could say, well, that was a blue wall, not a green wall, and everything else. Yeah, you but, know, they uh, never hit you as much as you said she did. That's yeah, all right. of course. Yeah. Like, there's all these kind of dialogues around that. Mm. And so, I know um, one of my stories in particular called The Knife. Uh, what's been really powerful about sharing that story is people who've gone through experiences like the experiences in The Knife saying, I know what that feels like. And so as a human being, it's really great to offer up an experience or a truth or an interpretation of an experience and have people come back and go, I'm glad that you wrote that because I know what that feels like. And so um, I guess fiction offers me the ability to share certain things, but not in a confessional space. Yeah, and okay. I've always been I've always been reluctant of that sort of overt. I went through this, this is what I did, only because 
I like the universality of things and I like mm. people who've gone through things connecting that. So I think what's kept me going in spite of challenges as a writer is that I know who my readers are and they're very specific. <laughs> They've had certain times of lives and I know that it matters that I write for them. Mm. I know they're also not the majority of people, to be honest. Like I think they're, although some people might identify with it, but they're quite often people who felt unheard or misunderstood or ignored. Mm. And I guess a lot of people feel like that, but then there are also people who have had a systemic experience of that. And mm. so it's really important that someone writes about the unfashionable or the uncool, but yeah. the incredibly significant in this world who haven't found things worked out the way they know mm. they would. I've I've noticed that with your writing as well. It's like it, you, it it's not like a hey, let's just pick up a book and just you know, just escape into a fantasy world. I think people want to feel when they read. I think so. They want to feel, and that's what they they're getting from from your writing, and that's what you share. Is this? It's almost like a safe space to feel something that they may not have allowed themselves to, and they. And it may trigger an emotion or a, a past memory or something. And then that's a safe way to be in that. And that's where the fiction comes in from your, from the way you write that fiction then allows everyone to join in into that safe space. I, I really appreciate that, Josh, because that's what I've always hoped I could do. Mm. Uh, and I am aware and I've had occasionally had great indifference to this as a concept. <laughs> I've had quite impressive resistance to it at times, in fact. Uh, but that was always my motivation, for sure, that I believe feeling things is important for people mm. to be happier in their own skin and to get by in this world. And even if we go to an interpersonal level, I know in my own experience, like feeling has enabled me to connect better with people around me. And it's interesting how much a feeling of belonging is so pivotal to what I do because I i mean, I hate the thought that someone might feel that they don't belong on this earth mm. or that they don't have people they can turn to or people they can trust. So, yeah, it's, a, um, it's quite a spiritual thing for me, my writing in terms of connectivity to people. It's certainly not a traditionally religious thing, but it's quite a spiritual thing mm, in a sense like just- that... Yeah, and I think for me, it's something that my career thus far has enabled is that I can really connect with people. I can listen to them. I can spend time with them. I can see them. And I'm not in a line where a publicity person's giving them post-it notes with their name. And then I just have to bust out all those signatures. Like I can do the signatures, but I can think about what I want to say to them Mm. or really spend time with them. So there have been times where I thought, well, you know, this is pretty uh, kind of uh, suburban and this is feeling pretty small scale. But I also, I know on some level that this is, it echoes what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So that's, I guess, gets me through the, uh, you know, slightly leaner days and the pot noodles or whatever else we're (laughs) with at any given point in time. Oh look, because I, I, look, the the life of a writer is often glorified, or it's um, you know, it's 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 put up here as like the ultimate thing that you know you can to, to live the life of a writer is is to live the dream, but you know, as you know, we only mm. th- through the media or through associations, it's usually the successes that we see that yes. are up there. I mean. Even they may not be earning as much as what we think they are, but it, it's in no, the way true. they've been lauded up here and, you know, they've won the Pulitzer or whatever. And, um, however, but it's the, it's the day-to-dayness of being mm. a writer that fascinates I think, me. It's, it's and the, it's so pivotal. Mm, you go. I was going to say, but it's that, it's that courage to, to keep turning up, to keep wading through the mess and the ugliness of, of what being a writer is like and to keep doing it, to me, that's that's one of the most inspiring aspects of being a writer. Mm, well, I, I mean, I certainly working with other writers, I feel like my challenges have been strangely valuable in hindsight now mm. that I'm working with writers who really want to get ahead in the industry and that I can pass on the reality 
of being a writer for sure. So a lot of writers. I'm just going to let all our viewers know that you are a mentor as well. And actually that's That's where you make a big, big chunk of your, your income. Am I right? Yeah. So my writing related work is kind of, um, well, it was, it's twofold. So the mm. obviously survival is a big part of that. And I need to get by as a, as a writer and someone working in the writing related fields. The other thing is that I, so when I first started writing, um, I met a writing teacher and I was very excited about all of this. And they weren't in a great place at that time, which I can see in hindsight. But as a young writer, what happened was mm. they kind of just abandoned me. Oh. And it felt quite a poignant thing to go through. Gee, and I remember when it, oh, it's okay. It happened. And in fact, they said to me later, what happened when I didn't get back to you and I stopped contacting you back and forth? And I said, I kept going. And they said, yeah, you kept going. And they were like, yes, you know, lesson over. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, but we could have done that a little easier. <laughs> but my point yeah, thanks being. Thanks for the trauma. That, yeah, thanks for the trauma. Um, but no, I recall at that exact moment saying to myself, if you're ever in a position where you can give back or you can help other writers, you need to do that because that will make a big difference to the writers here. Uh, so Is that, is that, is that because that- you felt for, you know, getting back to your childhood as well and just being, hmm. the, being the youngest child and, and really like having to yeah. almost rely on yourself and then that started with the with the writing. It's almost like, when you realise that you didn't have to do it alone and you, you yeah. then there was the impetus to go, well, I can now help other people because I don't want them to feel like what I did in a way. I mean, I think you're right on some level. I think what's been really hard about that journey has never been helping other writers. It's been accepting that all of me is helpful. So when I first started teaching writers, I just figured that, having a story on BBC Radio and being in Best Australian Stories and those awards, et cetera, were what made me a good teacher because I clearly knew how to write. And I think that's true to some extent. But I also think there are some great writers who are terrible teachers. And so I think the reason why I've become reasonably good at assessing it, mentoring, et cetera, I hope, Mm. is that, in fact, it was starting to accept that my mess ups and my flaws and my growth would help these writers just as much that actually me being me and telling them if I'd had a rough day or whatever without oversharing yeah, yeah, yeah. would actually help them identify and go, Oh, I know what that's like. I know what that's like when a rejection comes through or even to know timelines are massive things with that too. So Part of me, I also created like a group in Facebook called the Subcommittee where I share thoughts and feedback and stuff with other writers. And that originally was a group I was in in 2011. Uh, We were part of a group called the Subcommittee where a bunch of us writers decided to stretch ourselves and grow and go for new dreams and goals. And so 10 years later after that had long gone, I thought, well, this would be a really cool thing to set up for people getting into the industry so that they stop stressing about the big win that means they're a big deal and they start realizing that everyone around them who's doing the same dream is gold like it's it's a gem and it will sustain them when things aren't going the way they want them to go um so look you know it's also feasible within that space some of the writers i work with are working within markets and Mm -hmm. so on some level you're like all right, you're just going to hit that marketing space and you're going to do your thing and it's going to blow up. Mm. I know that's important for me to be them for them, but it's also important for me to be there for people who are really obsessed with language and they're writing beautiful stuff. And on some level, I already know they're going to have these challenges that Mm. exist within the publishing landscape. So, yeah, I think ultimately togetherness is so important to me and even having spoken to quite you know established high profile authors a strange takeaway is that they usually seems they're more lonely than i am because they don't have those networks of connection 
with other writers. And they, is that is that partly because when you are deemed successful, you suddenly go into another section, another stratosphere where there's a not many other people there. If, um, yes, I'm trying to that uh, that are supportive because we know what it's like in this industry is there's a lot of jealousy, there's a lot of resentment, yes. there's a lot of, oh, why are they successful and I'm not? That kind of mm. thing that happens, and that's just been real. It, it, everyone you know, yeah, feels sure. that at times. And I suppose that's what you do, is you help people navigate those feelings as well. Yeah, well, you must. I mean, and to. it's something that, yeah, even in my space post, you belong here. Um, and you know as well, once your book's out, you're in a different space again. So it's kind of, suddenly one looks back at one's emerging days with great fondness as well because you're in a different space there as well mm. so i think that evolution of the writer and i don't mean that in terms of you know material success i guess i mean in terms of that emotional process yeah. we go through um i think it's integral that someone mm. is there who they can that can be honest with them and be real with them as they go about this because the other thing that exists in our industry is a lot of misinformation and there's also people with vested interests mm. and that's fine. And all you really want to do with your authors is equip them to make the best possible decision they can make. Ideally, it's a win-win. So mm -hmm. sometimes some of the writers I've worked with, I mean, you've had a couple of them on your show, like Emmy Young and David Allen Patali. Yeah. They found a really good situation for themselves. They've worked with passionate people um it still enabled them to advocate for their book and promote their book like they do on social media and everything it was just a great fit mm. and so that's going to be a personal thing too so the other thing that i think a lot of writers struggle with is that there are these preconceived notions of the biggest publishers being the best full stop without consideration of what the work is and whether it fits mm. the type of publishing that happens at that level. So mm. that mm. can be a difficult but necessary conversation. I, I, too, I to totally, say, you know, totally agree with you. I mean, I know people who are with the big publishers and yep. you have a chat with them, are just, you know, having a couple of beers and you go, what's it, what's it like? And they go, well, that's fantastic. They love you for two weeks and then they drop you. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah, go, that's true. Really? And they go, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, you know, you get really intense. Two weeks, bang, you're on the road, bang, 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 bang. And then after that, you're gone. And I, yeah. I, look, and at, I look at who I'm with, you know, Big Sky Publishing, mm. and, and just a small indie publisher over in, over in the Eastern States. And we've got a great relationship. I can yeah. talk to them. I can send them an email. I can do all that sort of stuff. And it's an ongoing process. And it's yeah. like, oh, so the bigger isn't always the best. I, Not always. You know, yeah. sometimes it's, it's it, really handy to get book files. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it can be like also, if it's a good fit, it's the best. Like, yeah. I mean, if you look at someone like Brooke, Brooke Davis with uh, Lost and Found at Hachette, like mm -hmm. there's a big difference between if you're published by a big publisher and they're psyched about it and they're so buzzed to be pushing your book and make it a big deal. Then if you're on the list and there's a bunch of bigger stuff going on yeah. around you, like that's yeah. a totally different experience. So, you know, I think it can work really well. Um, I also, I don't know, in my experiences, you've got to work out what your price is in certain points. And certainly mm. while working with you belong here, I had an experience or two where the communication was actually like really terrible and it was yeah. unprofessional at certain publishing houses to the point of feeling really validated by it mm, and mm. so it can be tempting to let those things slide while one is pursuit of a big win but one must be very careful about that i mean i recall the conversation with that publisher them saying to me look if we were to take this on and we were sort of semi-interested in it we'd be doing you no favors because we're expecting to hit certain numbers if you don't hit those numbers with your debut then that looks pretty bad as you go forward Whereas if you build in smaller areas, then mm. you can make that leap with a bit more confidence, a greater readership behind you and things like that. Um, but it does get into that idea of why we write and what we're aiming to do within that space too. Mm. So I know like the difficult conversations are always where you get into publishers saying, well, what's the readership for this? And if you're writing a book about werewolves, then you've got your predefined readership. But once you get into literature, it gets incredibly hard to be that calculated and cold. Like, 
I mean, if you went on a musical front and you said to, I don't know, even System of a Down or one of the more hard rocking sort of bands, they found a listenership, but I think they would have been a hard sell at the starting point because yeah, yeah. they sound different. So this is where literature gets interesting is that there are amazing books out there that have a hard time getting published because mm. of the way the industry works. And that's no diss on the industry. It's just Well, it's designed to make money. The whole idea is the publishing. Of course, of course. To make it's money. how the sausages are made. Mm. Yeah, exactly mm. right. So mm. it's not a good or a bad thing. It's more an awareness of who one is. And I guess where it becomes problematic is that many writers I've known or worked with or whatever, of course they want to be the big deal. They want to be the thing that everyone's excited about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it works, it's a ripper. I mean, even I was talking to Craig Sylvie last Friday night in an interview and I said, what's like the best thing that you've, the whole journey? And he said, well, I'd have to say pretty close would be sitting on the set of Jasper Jones watching Hugo Weaving read out the lines that I wrote. And I thought yeah. that's pretty epic. Like I could see why yeah. one would want to be in that space where things like that happen. So it's a real fine line mm. because you're right. It's there to make money. And there are certain types of expectations on what kind of books should be out there to make money and are pushable. Um, and so as a writer, you can't really second guess that too much. You just create the work you create and then sort of hope it finds its readership and its readership might yeah i i I agree i I suppose relating it back to myself with with my kids books it's like um yes in my mind i'm looking at everyone else out there and going oh look at andy griffiths oh you know yeah 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 (laughs) and and you go oh this is what's going to happen to me and uh, yeah no and then when you realize that that what you create and what you write is 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 different to everything else is mm. not the commercial sort of fit that every publisher is looking for. It's not your standard type of kid's book. You go, Oh, and then you have to, you almost, to be honest, you've got to go mm. through a small grieving period of the loss of that yes. ambition. And then that, sure. has, then that makes way for, okay, what is it that I really really want yeah to i get to be me now i get, I get to be me i mean and what a gift like really i get to be me and now i write what i write yes. and that is a good thing and it's yes. a gift and it's valuable it's just valuable in a different way yes. um and it may also over time lead to this process we don't know but i, I think you're right to acknowledge that one's uniqueness is the gift it's also the challenge when we exist in a homogenized industry that needs titles to push and publish regularly. Yes. So it's uh, that one knocked me for six when I first worked it out. Like mm. I genuinely was surprised that my uniqueness was going to slow me down in terms of mainstream publishing success yeah. because I just figured I would be good enough at writing mm. that I would hit that higher echelon and that all of that would eradicate. So one of the funniest things when working with You Belong Here was I kind of came in with these medals of honour, you know, of literary publication or awards or whatever it was, thinking they would really matter and that people would go, oh, wow, Larry Steed, you know, you've Mm. done all these things. They couldn't care less. They were like, well, what's this book? What am I doing with this book? How do I market this book? And it's Mm. you do feel a little bit like you're in, you know, Australian Idol or, the voice or something like it's like suddenly all this effort you put into it is kind of rendered redundant mm. by the need to have a marketable item that they can sell. Um, for me, I'm not sure I've quite got my head around how my journey shifts on the back of that information. Um, as of yet, I'm kind of doubling down on just being me and just mm. doing what I do well because I don't, I think a watered down me would suck in comparison to me being wholeheartedly me. It's a tough realization and it might make my life harder in terms of that stuff, but I'm not a good cover artist. Like I've always <laughs> been a very good me artist. Like mm. <laughs> I've always just been an artistic person. So it's like, and in terms of what I value. So even when people say to me, Oh, this move this many units or whatever, 
who let the dogs out moved a lot of units? It doesn't mean it's a good song. Like, it's terrible. Because so I, I, I know you, you're, you are a big advocate for actually allowing more space in the publishing industry for a variety of types of literature. And I, and I know yeah, I you, so. you, you sometimes rail against the, the, the commercialization or the way that the, it, it is currently structured. And, and, I, and I, I get that. And I think there is, I think there is space. There's so many mm. different other, other you know, different levels of, of whether it's literary fiction or whatever to be out there. Yeah. And, and I'm going to segue beautifully into Nova. Sure. Your... <laughs> the, the most artistic work one can create in that it's literally art hanging in a gallery at the moment. Yeah. That was, I mean, that's I, about as artistic as it gets. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a, a side thing from that because Nova is a collection of short stories that you've written because you're – you have yeah. a passion for short stories, okay? I, I love short stories, I've, I've, and I've, I can't I've, even get away from that. I mean, there's a particular post that, in hindsight, is hilarious uh, that I wrote for Louise Allen, where I said, after you belong here, I'm going to write a collection of short fiction. Because what I'm going to do, because I love it, and it's going to be the best, and it's going to be amazing. And it was. It's also really hard to publish. So it's very interesting to create a world of miniatures that you're deeply proud of, and I also worked with Amanda Curtin. She edited the collection, did an amazing job, and find that resistance uh, in terms of the publishing space and have to reconcile with that. So I started writing Nova just after You Belong Here mm. was accepted for publication. And the idea behind it was that it would be this giant love letter to friendship and to romance yeah. and to mother-daughter, father-son, father-daughter, mother-son relationship, just to this idea of being there for someone yeah. and how important it is. Um, so I started it in earnest and it even had, it was bookended by these two, I guess you'd call them sort of letters to yeah. a sister as well saying, hey, I don't really understand this, but I want to write some beautiful stuff about the world and, and love, just love 100%. So, like, be vulnerable and raw and fragile and all these things. And so it came fairly quickly with some revisions. And generally it's a funnier collection than You Belong Here. Yeah. It's even more sort of emotional and emo than You Belong Here was. Um, it's kind of a, a reconciliation of, of I guess, loss as mm. part of love in that mm. respect. Mm. So it was a lot of fun to write. I mean, there's a story with where a guy, his uncle is Daryl Hall from Hall & Oates, but he's having a rough patch. So um, he comes and stays with the nephew and the nephew isn't ready to commit to his girlfriend who's moved to, um, I think it's Boise, Idaho. And she keeps going on. No, it's Toledo, Idaho. And she keeps going on about how amazing it is. And the, the nephew's like, I'm not going to move. I don't want to. It's not worth it. And Uncle Daryl, you know, who's master <laughs> of these beautiful love songs over the years, is like, you're a pussy, you know, come on. you got to man up. you got to do this. Somewhere. And they eventually, they write this song together. They play to her from she's up on her balcony and they play this song and started a new life together. So there's a lot of... Um, I mean, I love the collection and I, yeah. I mean, Amanda loved it too. So it, it feels like, in fact, I've never had a collection where every reader loved it until it gets to a point of publishing consideration. And then they're mm. like, it's, they said, and they'd say, it's, it's beautiful. Mm. We're not going to publish it. Like, this is crazy. Is that, like, is that, this is so you've, you've pitched it to several publishers? A couple of places, a couple yeah. of publishers so far. Mm. And um, I mean, it was a difficult one because I wrote it while working under the assumption that this would continue with my current publisher, they yeah. chose to finish up publication. So oh, then was what fun. was, well, I guess what was more poignant about it was that you realise how important a good altruistic publisher is in a space like this. Yeah. Like I've had some very frank conversations with about Nova with one friend in particular. So, um, I have a friend who's a publisher at a firm press, a guy called Martin Hughes, and he's hilarious. And um, we've talked about pretty much every project I've worked on. And he's like, he said it originally, he's like, go and write, go and write, he's Irish. He said, go and write a great book. Just go and write a, a fucking great book. It'll be amazing, you know. 
And then I, I did, I think. <laughs> and he said, he said, eh, it's brilliant. It's amazing. What do you want me to say? He says, you can't tell short stories. You know, this is a fucking, what are you doing? Why do you keep doing it? I'm kind of getting over this. Like, I don't understand what's wrong with you that you keep doing this. And he said to me something which did stick with me and which I passed on to other writers. He said, the thing you need to understand about the majority of publishers is that we are not curators. We are suppliers to bookstores. So if you come to me with something like Nova, I've got to work out how the hell I make that something a bookstore is psyched yeah. about and wants in bulk numbers and yes. things like that. Now, it didn't change my approach in terms of the writing and the revision of this work. I'm aware on some level, though, I think I know more about my readership mm. than I did. The hard part about that is it's very hard to convince a commercial enterprise that a limited readership is still equally powerful and important and that this will be the type of book people will talk about. That's because they don't want you to talk about it for significance. They want you to talk about it because it's topical or because yeah, yeah, yeah. it hits the zeitgeist or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So my, real, my biggest challenge, I think, is really that I'm always obsessed with universal significance versus topicality. Or mm. do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you're, like, from what I, the thread I get with your stories and the way you write, mm. they're all human stories. They're all things that we. Yeah, can absolutely. Connect. They're absolutely and, um, connective mm. about our shared realities versus, mm. you know, identity politics or anything within that. So I, I often embrace differences part of that and so my characters are usually relatively diverse things like that it's more that what i care about is like vulnerability and mm. openness and love so it's very hard when you are psyched up on that stuff to get topical or to be buzzy or i can't trendy sell love whatever. How am I going to sell position and vulnerability? Come on. Ah, uh, look, I mean, I mean, this is what's poignant. I guess it's poignant in the sense that most of the music I love has greater reach. That is mm. kind of like my writing. So if you go in the musical sphere, a band like Iron and Wine or Bon Iver uh, or Band of Horses, you know, these are all great bands that have, have, write have, beautiful have, stuff. Have, have, have you got a Spotify playlist for this? I do. It's online. It's there. Uh, yeah, okay. all the songs okay. that it's Email it to me and I'll put it in the show notes. Sure, I'd love that. I'd be happy yeah. to do that. So, yeah, music's a huge thing for me. And Nova, again, had some musical stuff going on within there. Mm. I mean, I was lucky in the sense there was one story from Nova, the Butterfly Fish, um, which was shortlisted for the Neil Sydney Prize. And I was the only bummer on that was that they didn't publish all the shortlisted mainly because um, it's my love letter to the band Girlfriend from the 1990s, who I was obsessed with as a teenager. So I was really hoping it would get out to the world and everyone would go, Girlfriend, I don't think I remember that band. Let's find out what they were doing and let's listen to some of their and songs. And relaunch their career. Then, <laughs> well, this was, I mean, we talked about the road trip. The other really mm. fun thing that I remember from my teenage years is, is like imprinted there is that, as 15-year-olds, so year 10, I think that would make us, five of us went to a girlfriend concert, uh, five guys together, and like we all we had the girlfriend shirts on, and we were like, right. Glory, glory, glory. I know, I know. So, look, this was the thing, um, was that it was a really cool thing to go see this concert. Um, and, you know, it was a weirdly empowering thing to not be at any number of the metal gigs we went to or any of the more sort of rock and masculine yeah. Yeah. spaces we've been in and we all played footy and stuff so it was kind of a, a lark of sorts but yeah. um yeah for me it's this idea of homage is really important as well so like sometimes i feel our culture moves so fast and dispels like there's nostalgia around, but some things really get missed in that space. Mm. And also discussion of why they're great gets missed. So sometimes 80s culture is like this big nugget of bubble gum that's just been banded together and no one talks about individual bands or the songs that they sang or what they were trying to do. Mm. And I think I know there's an interview from Daryl Hall where he talks about why he writes the songs he writes and it's, it's so exciting to me to think about why other artists what yeah. they're doing and why they're doing it. So, um, yeah, so Nova was this strangely nebulous thing that um, 
ironically not unlike Anova, the so mm. star after which yeah. it's named, um, that found its way to an art, a visual artist, and she made a bunch of prints based on the short stories. Um, there's, there's a typewriter in the exhibition that had my manuscript of Nova in the typewriter with the oh, pile wow. of the manuscript next to it. So it was like a pivotal part of it was like the the writer, you know. Yeah. And so it was really quite a strange space to be in where one had all this visual representation of the work and where single stories did really well um, in terms of as they as my single stories have typically been pretty, done pretty well. Mm. And so I get publication, a couple a story in Westerly and, yeah, a prize shortlisting for single works within that. Mm. Um, it's just that the expectation with Nova, and it's a fair expectation, is how does this hang together as a marketable commercial? Yeah. Is, it, is, is, it, is it the age-old thing that short stories and poetry really, you just yeah, can't really stuff. tell? It, it you really just to acknowledge them. that, okay, that's going to be in that sort of solo or that section. You're never going to be a successful no, poet unless you have um, Leonard Cohen or something like that. Or... <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a really, I, don't, I think for me, what was actually kind of the seeds of Nova also helped in it being in the challenging space still now. So I went mm. to Iowa in 2012 on a fellowship and the United States and Iowa in particular is it's a city of literature. So they have, statues of authors and they have oh, wow. words from text imprinted in the footpath in gold and things like that and lots of great bookstores and on the front tables of bookstores in the u.s short story collections are there alongside the novels and they're a big deal so having no, they... gone to iowa and having i mean there are and there are quite revered authors they're maybe not at the same level but they're certainly higher up in the u.s than they are in australia so like a miranda july or a laurie moore um or Raymond Carver you know these are all big deals in the states so having loved short stories so much and having been in a space that did revere them I kind of it was a, I guess it was a promise to myself that I would having taught short stories having had great success with single stories I would venture into the darkest wood of them all the short story collection which I still think I will get out of Yep. I believe I'll chop down a tree here, a tree there, and then this collection will be out in the world. I'm looking it's forward to seeing that. that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm buzzed about the book, and mm. it's a weird feeling to not have that feeling of like, oh, my second book. I actually think it's awesome. I think it's a better book than You Belong Here. Mm. It's just that it's not as marketable as You Belong Here, which admittedly also due credit to my publisher in going, this is a novel because I'm not sure it really is, <laughs> but I really, I'm really grateful that they decided mm. to frame it that way because <laughs> uh, I think it probably would have got even less, even fewer readers had it been marketed as an interlinked collection or whatever oh, you want to okay. do with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, look, I still think You Belong Here is a novel. It's just that it was written as a series of stories. So uh, You Belong Here was originally 52 stories, which was weaned down to 20 for the final book. Mm. Um, so it originally covered like four generations of the family and eventually only covered really two with one final epilogue where we go into the third gen. Mm. Mm. So I guess this is the other thing is that existing with an industry where you have artistic tendencies, like it's quite a fascinating thing to go through because as a single story writer, you can exist in that space all your yeah. life really and find journal publication and things like that. When one wants to exist within the publishing landscape, these considerations are real. Like they, it's kind of like the horse that got you to the gate mm. will not get you through the village. Like, and that's what's really interesting. No, so you can work. True. But 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 there are still lots of examples of, of books out there that are not traditional, but have yes. ended up been successful. I mean, this is where I'm going to really test my brain here. You know, what's the, what's the um. Something about Kevin. I can't remember who wrote that, but that was a series of actual. Oh yeah, episodes. we need to talk about Kevin. Yeah, yeah we need look, to talk about I mean, Kevin. And and, and what was George right. George Saunders? Is it George Saunders? Um, oh, Lincoln Nevado. Lincoln Nevado. That's that's yeah, you know, yeah, sure. Really I different. Mean, and I think I think what is probably important for writers to know in all of this space 
is timelines. So, I mean, I can mm. tell you a story about one of the writers. Obviously, you talked to David Alan Patali, yes, Focus yes. Summer, mm. amazing book, you know, incredible book. Yeah. And the journey on that is longer than it appears yes. on the outside. So it's important to know that great work takes time mm. and it can even take missteps uh, along the way. So I remember mm. Michael Luna came to Perth Rose Festival a few years back and he said how important it is to be stuck and to sit in that stuck that state of stuckness and yes. get to the other side. And I think a lot of writers miss that as a necessary part of the journey i just don't don't think they're aware on some level probably necessarily so because it would hurt Mm. their hopes and their aspirations that one can be profoundly stuck or one can have something shift within a book Mm. that changes everything so and 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 you can look back and go i'm so glad that happened because when i was speaking to, to emma young and she was saying that you know her manuscript. She just it just got torn to shreds by several different uh, agents, and then one just said, "What the hell are you doing?" And then she had yeah, to literally yeah. go back and pull the whole thing apart, and rip it yes. apart, and and literally, you know, cut it all out, put post-it notes everywhere. And that's when I said to her, are, "You know, did you feel like a real writer when you mm. were doing in that space?" And in she said, space. "Hell yes, that's yes, what I felt because yes. it nice. wasn't coming easily." And then everybody yeah. think, oh, writing just flows from your fingers. No. <laughs> For me, it doesn't. I actually find writing really, really hard. And I find it oh, a no, challenge. No. Look, I mean, the um, getting back to the Iowa trip again, mm. part of the reason I'd gotten to Iowa was on the back of this short story that I'd written. And that's what I'd submitted. And I went into Iowa thinking she was just going to high five me over and over and say, wow, you know, great story. And in fact, what happened was I went there and she asked if anyone wanted to volunteer to submit their work first for workshopping. And of course, my hand shot up straight away. I'm like, yes, totally, great. ready for the praise, you know. And what she did, in fact, with the second lesson, was she created a lesson out of everything the three of us had done wrong in the stories we submitted, <laughs> which was insanely confronting. Wow. So she did that. And then she met with me and the other two afterwards as well, one, one-on-one. And she said to me, this, this story of yours, she said, it's okay. And for whatever reason, that was the worst thing she could have said about my work. Like if she said it, I hate it or it's challenging. It's or whatever, mediocre. It's, fine. it's okay. It's mediocre. It's okay, she said. <laughs> and it was incredible the fire that lit under me in that story, that statement that it was okay. Mm. And um, she said something else which really stuck with me. She said, you keep trying to tell me what your story is about rather than showing me. And if you can just show me, it'll be the best story. And so what was weird was I thought for a while we're working on that, I'm going to prove to her that this is a great story. And in hindsight, I didn't mean to prove that to her at all. She believed it could be great. It was mm. just that it wasn't at all where it needed to be. And so what was really interesting about that is once you pull apart something like that and rebuild it, you never hit that same level of stuckness again either because you know how important the rebuild is. So, yeah, I mean, that story had a lot of success after meeting her. And yet I recall that day when she said it was okay. And I recall everyone's reaction to having their work torn apart in that space. So some would go to a, three of them went to a dive bar and like drank themselves stupid into the night. And another three of them got together and just bished and moaned about how wrong she was. Mm. And then me and uh, my friend Val, we went to a waffle house first thing the next morning. (laughs) And we got the coffee on boil. We got our waffles and we just sat down and went, right, what are we going to yeah. do with this? How are we going to make it better? Yep. So um, there's a lot of humility in this journey too. And mm, mm. if you're, I mean, if you're lucky, there's not, and you're just marketable and no one ever pulls you up on your bullshit. But <laughs> if you're- That's, that's, right, where, like, that's where a good editor and mentor can help. So oh my gosh. Yes. What, what, what is the, why is it important to have a mentor? Uh, well, from my experience, I was lucky enough to have a mentor or two myself coming up. Mm. So Susan Medallia and Bridget Lowry were just amazing for me what in was that Bridget regard. Like? Was, was she like the silent assassin at times? I could imagine <laughs> her being a silent assassin. <laughs> well, Hi, Bridget, I know you're this, watching this. 
she has this phrase which I loved at the time. She said, I've just made a few little tweaks. And her tweaks were like expert cuts, like incisions to go, mm-hmm. hang on, let the air out of this. So she taught me a lot about writing. Um, she taught me a huge amount about being a human being. So the other thing that would happen is every time I went and saw it, I'd bring a cake or some biscuits. And um, one time she just stopped and she said, you need to stop bringing me things. You need to just come by yourself as yourself. And I mean, I'm getting emotional talking about it now, but it was an incredible permission to go, okay, you need to stop making this worthwhile. Like you're worthwhile. Mm. So um, yeah, I felt like she really saw me on a very basic level, uh, which was incredibly valuable. And as for Susan, um, she sat with me while going through the rapids with You Belong Here. So You Belong Here had an interesting backstory in that a friend of mine, a dear friend, put it forth to a very big publisher and was Mm. like, hey, this guy's amazing. And so we were with them for about a year and a couple of times they said it was beautiful and then marketability and sales would come Mm. up and things like that. So Susan sat through me with... Uh, sat with me through all of that and got me to my eventual publisher, which was, I mean, if a mentor does that, that's a very that's decent pretty mentor. Good. Mm. That's pretty good. So I think really it's kind of like a lot of writers think it's a valley. Like it's just, I, I mean, that there's no peaks, that it's mm. literally just a path that you walk, but it's not. There are no. mountains everywhere. It, it's, it's an a emotional form, roller coaster. You it's feel an emotional alive. roller coaster when you do it because there are so many emotions to feel yeah that's right so i i think my role as a mentor there's something deeply valuable about being there for someone and that can go above and beyond what you initially thought it might be and it looks different in every case so i had one writer who buzzed me pretty much every day in the lead up to publication and i was totally cool with it because they were having a moment because it's a big deal Mm. and there are other writers who might sort of want to grab a coffee every couple of weeks, talk about writing as Mm. opposed to their work. You know, it it really varies on the writer and what will speak to them and what will help them feel that they're most capable and most excellent. The most interesting part of it for me is working with those writers who are aware they need to go above and beyond. Yeah. And that really everything they want is on mm. the other side of stretching. So mm. there's nothing more exciting to me than when I give back feedback on a manuscript and go, I hope they can do this. I think they can. I hope they can. And they do. And they knock it out of the park. Yeah. And I kind of knew they would, but I don't think they knew they would. And that's what's really cool about it. Is so you, that you basically I, uncover their own belief in themselves that they may not understand, may not realize, and they've put written this manuscript, go, hey, it's really awesome. And then you you come along, look at it, and you walk them through the process of finding themselves in that, finding their truth well, in that. Yeah. And I mean there's an aspect of story mechanics too. So oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. other thing about reading so much and writing so much is that you just start to know how stories tick. Mm. So I can certainly give them practical advice on strengthening their manuscript. It's so integral to maintain their vision though. Like the reason being that they will encounter other people's opinions of what their work is, that's that's inevitable. Now, if you don't start off on your own vision and your own strength of voice, then who the hell are you anyway going into the space? Like this is why it's so important is that, if you don't back the writer at the point pre-submission of their strength of voice and their strength of vision, then you do them a great disservice because this is about as pure as a space can be when someone is writing on the page. They're they're being vulnerable and honest and open in a way that they might not even do in their day-to-day lives. And I've, I've certainly had mentees before who didn't tell anyone they were writing. They were just writing, yeah, in in secrecy. Mm. So that's a very trusted space too. So Mm. I think um, I think it's really valuable in the sense that the industry can be exploitative, it can be dismissive, and so even to have that one person who values you and what you do 
not by what's been achieved already, but by you doing it and by you being a writer. So I definitely, I said to a couple of writers recently published that the manuscript is the gift, like that they gave themselves an amazing gift. They, Mm. They promised themselves they would create something beautiful. They did. And they both ended up being published, which is great. If they hadn't, they'd still be kick-ass books. They'd be beautiful yeah, okay. books and yeah. they'd be amazing authors. Mm-hmm. And so that spirit of intention is so important too. Mm-hmm. And you can pick it up. So in my work, I mostly work with pretty genuine writers who are just psyched and they want to, yeah. they want to know the world better and stuff. Every now and again, I'll, I'll sort of bear into the sort of all caps sort of space of significance and notability. And they're usually not very good writers because they don't care. And that yeah. so caring is so important in all this. Like, it's so important that the writers I work with care because I, I care deeply and mm. I'll make sure I'm there for them in ways that, you know, in certain terms of that, if someone buzzes me, I get back to them straight away. Mm. Like, and so it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not a, an interaction someone goes into lightly, is it? When they, when they make the call no. to go, I, I really would like a mentor because I am serious about this and I yes. can't just rely on myself. And I mean, and let's be clear, some of the writers I've worked with are some of the best writers I've come across, period, anyway. Mm. So I wouldn't say that they, I would hope they may have got there on their own. I think I helped them and I certainly helped accelerate the process. These are talented writers and most, the nature of the writing space is competitive enough or the industry that I'm not working with writers who aren't that great and could could pull them pull no, their socks up a bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm working with gun writers who've written great work mm. who are aware that it needs to be even greater to get mm. picked up. And, and I, think, so, I, think, I think that's where there's this perception that that a book just people just go off into a room, write a book, go as it gets published. No, the more and more people I speak to, everyone has had manuscript assessments done, mentors, yeah. all that sort of stuff to bring out the best in their work and, and in themselves yeah, yeah. to do it. Yeah, so the industry in days past, one would submit and then there would be an intensive editorial process and a lot of editorial support. And there still is editorial support. It's just that most publishers' consideration, argument, whatever it is, is is there little enough work to be done to this that it's viable we can get this done on a timeline and work within that. So really you're trying to make your submission bulletproof Mm. to a point before it even gets there. So it's the same with my process with You Belong Here was borderline obsessive really. I'd done a PhD and had two supervisors the entire time. I then had both Bridget and Susan working with me on the manuscript. Um, Once with MRP, I still had developmental edit and then a copy edit on the back of that. Um, And so... I guess the best version of the story when you mm. get a mentor on board and everything else would be like I had with one of my clients where the publisher said, there's hardly anything to do to this. Like by this um, point, like, Lee, yes, yeah, yes, a thousand cool. times, yes, I want to publish this. Let's do it. We're done. Mm. So I think you're right that the mythology of the writer gets in the way of just how long gestation times are. Like there are other writers that I haven't necessarily worked with that I know who win a big award or something. And then there's no, we, there's no talking of the sheer amount of energy and effort they put in in mm. the years prior to get to that point. So I think we do have a sort of a mythology of starts. And so it goes, look, here's this author. You've never heard of them. They're a big deal. They just did it. And yet in most writers' cases, and certainly most writers have known, mm. um, there's even, I mean, uh, some of the bigger writers you heard of who might have big books out last year or so, there's manuscripts between the published books too that didn't work out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like exactly. That. You're only and hearing that is, one part of the whole story. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really important that writers talk with other writers because this is how we learn what the landscape looks like and how we learn not to beat ourselves up as much when things aren't working the way we want it. Mm. Um, because it's inevitable. It's inevitable that at some point it's your turn to be stuck. 
<laughs> and it's everyone else's turn to have big yep. wins and and, 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 it, and it's and it's how you negotiate that and and come out the other side fighting and none of it's easy none of it's easy no. like it's it's incredibly challenging i think it's incredibly challenging in a state like wa in particular because we're so supportive and mm. i'm really glad we're so supportive still if you're a writer who's having a hard time and you you are friends with everyone then you might be at six to eight launches mm. while you're trying to get your book published yeah. and things like that. Mm. So, um, yeah, I find, I think it's really important to meet with writers as a human being default. Like that's mm. the other thing that I find really empowering is that having spent time in Melbourne and other literary cultures, if you're in a room with operators, it, it's such a hideous space. Like there's nothing rewarding about that in the long run mm. and if even if you were a careerist person to an extent that i'm certainly not it just kind of saps the fun out of connecting with people over time too and then it's like okay you gain the world but you lost your soul along the way yeah so because you're too busy me, trying to go what can i get out of this as opposed that's to right. what connection can i make i mean certainly for me my missteps have been the making of me like mm. i was actually a bit of a jerk um a few years back <laughs> i mean i I'm find still, that I'm so hard just, to believe laurie well maybe i was like a laurie jerk so maybe that's <laughs> like a nice guy with slight jerkish tendencies but on my jerkish stuff really came out of this perfectionism and expecting to win without fail and really prioritizing it above all kinds of things like relationships and stuff like that and it's okay and the society really backs people like that too. And they say, this is the way you should do it. And so what's been interesting working on my latest project, which is memoir, is I had a very successful writer and I full respect to them. They're an excellent writer and successful writer. Say to me, I'm not so sure about this level of vulnerability and mm. openness within the form, because I think on some level that would be confronting to someone who is in that space of excellence and perfection because I was talking about the challenges of being a writer and how yeah. hard it is yeah. and things like that. And so I think there is a bit of a, that you're talking out of school when you admit oh. the realities of being a writer, especially yeah, I, when I, you I, get into the higher echelons. Yeah. So I know, um, I, I mean, when I went to Bulgaria in 2014, I went there on this fellowship mm. as well. And there's five of us from around the world. So like five Bulgarian writers, five writers from around the world. And we all came in there like five Michael Jordans, like I'm taking you out, like you're going down. I'm the one, like there's yeah, five yeah. of us, but we're all, and well, actually there's one really nice guy, but the other four of us were frosty. <laughs> and um, so what was really interesting over time was that as the fortnight wall sort of mm. wound on and we'd all kind of tried to alpha each other out, um, there was this last, dinner mm. and I rocked up. I've been wearing like a business shirt and pants the whole time and because I was like the first Australian fellow, so I felt like an ambassador sort of thing. Yeah. And um, it came to the last dinner and I rocked up in like hoodie and jeans and one of the girls, pretty much like my arch nemesis there, yeah. <laughs> she turned around to me and she went, oh, it's you. And for, But she didn't mean like, oh, it's you. Uh, she meant, oh, it's actually you. Like, oh, it's nice I to meet you. It's yeah. nice to meet you, Laurie Steed, the real person. Wow. Like, and it was kind of cool. And I was like, hey, it's cool to see you. And we talk like human beings for a night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and the lesson was the last like one. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is it. So I think the challenges with excellence and perfectionism and stuff, this, there is, I'd be lying to you, if I said that some of my achievements didn't feel amazing and mm. super exciting when they came through, it's just like Jack Cornfield. He has the saying, Jack Cornfield, which is after the ecstasy, the laundry. And this is the way we must work as writers mm. is that we're not always going to be knocking out of the park. Yes. And what we do when we're not will probably gauge how well we survive within the industry because it's a long, long game. Like people you meet, in 2010, you're going to see again in 2020 if they keep at it. And so being a jerk has a really short shelf life 
mm. in uh, Australian leather culture because there's not enough people for you to be a jerk and for it to work. You can't, you, you can't, you can't hide your jerkness because it's like, yeah. <laughs> you can't hide your jerkness. It's so true, Joe. So I think one of the really unique things and why I love being a mentor in WA, because obviously I moved back from Melbourne after my master's, is we're quite an earnest bunch and we're quite mm. a genuine bunch about doing what we want to and do. And also and supportive. We're all, and so supportive of people, mm. not necessarily in our field too. Mm. So while like one of my greatest memories was um, when I did the Perth Festival event for You Belong Here, having like Amanda Kurt and Michelle Michelle Crawford in the front row, like it meant a big deal to me because I really deeply respect them as writers, you know. I also, it's not that surprising if someone who wrote genre f- romance fiction mm. was at a literary event too or yeah. vice versa so i think one of the things i've really loved about this run of launches for my mentees is just seeing the array of different types of writers different people and um yeah feeling the energy and the willingness mm. for them all to support each other um yeah and, I agree with you that. know mm. i actually think i don't think i taught much in that regard to some of the writers who were the best at doing it. So like an Emma Young was already doing it before mm. she got published and she's just aware of the ecosystem. Dave's the same, yeah. uh, Mel Hall. So I think most of the writers are just aware of what a, a, a unique situation they're in in WA that a lot of them are with the same publishing house and how cool mm. is it they can all back each other and support yeah. each other that way. Mm. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, Given the challenges I've had with Nova, it's been a real gift to see, to help other writers yeah. and to go, actually, it's not, there's a Sark cartoon and it has a lady surrounded by people and the speech bubble, no, the thought bubble says, oh my God, what if I'm not the main character? And um, <laughs> I think for me, these last couple of years have been about not being the main character all the time yeah. and seeing how one might coexist in the space. and. Um, yeah, mm. it's, it's a fascinating journey. I, th- I think I think there's something in that for all of us, Laurie. Now, what's the, one last question. What lights you up? Oh, my gosh. Um, vulnerability, openness. Yep. I, um, I could, if I have an intense emotional conversation with someone, I feel incredibly hopeful about the world. I feel mm. like anything is possible when we share our realities and when we're open with each other. Well, you know what, Laurie, with people like you in the world, I have hope for the world. So thank you thank so you, much for taking the time to have a chat with me. Anytime. It was great to talk with you. Wow.